relationship with people that we don't necessarily agree with and everything. And Lord, I just continue to thank you for this church and for all that it does, Lord, for all of us. And Lord, I, I just thank you for your faithfulness and all that you've done in my life and all that I've seen you do. Thank you for your answered prayers, Lord. I pray for the missionaries of this church in this time, Lord, that you would continue to bless them, to just grant them fruit, Lord, and favor and blessing and increase in their ministries, Lord. I pray for our missionary, uh, Betty, Lord, and for her family in this time, that you would speak into her life what your will is, Lord, regarding her travels, Lord, regarding what she is to do, Lord. And I pray that you would just bless and just, uh, just grant peace to her family in this time. I pray for all those members of this church, Lord, that are sick right now, Lord. I just pray that your divine healing, Lord, would just be released into their lives, Lord Jesus. Lord, you give life to our bodies, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, Lord. And I just pray just for divine health, Lord, for all the members of this church. For all those who are sick, Lord, I pray for a swift recovery, Lord. And Lord, I, uh, I just pray uh, also for Pastor Andy with these decisions that are going to be made, Lord, by the consistory and, and by the other members of this church, Lord, and Pastor Andy himself regarding his sabbatical. Lord, I pray that your your holy divine will for his life and for this season would be realized regarding the times, Lord, regarding his itineraries, Lord, and all that he's going to do, Lord. Lord, I pray that you bless this season of his life, continue to just grant him revelation of what your will is for his life and for leading this church, Lord. And I thank you for all of the leaders and uh, all of the consistory, Lord, all of the pastors of this church, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dominic. I'm going to invite uh, Scott up here. And uh, we've been announcing the um, Iron Sharpens Iron. We had a great time with hundreds of people, hundreds of men in a packed place. Um, we didn't allow any women, although somebody did see one woman sneak into the gathering. But anyway, um, a great time of worship, instruction, inspiration. And Scott's going to share a little bit um, from his experience yesterday. Morning, Grace. As Andy already touched upon, ten of us went to Orland Park yesterday to the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference, and uh, I really didn't know what to expect. I've never been to an all men conference. I didn't know if it was just going to be like a pool of Christian masculinity, and <laughs> <laughs> it really just over exceeded my expectations. Uh, worship was really great there, and the conference was basically like broken down into four different sections. There were te two keynote speakers, and then there were two seminars one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And with the seminars, they like there were seven different seminars, seven for the morning, seven for the afternoon, and you could choose where you wanted to go. And before they broke us off into the seminars, they had like each person that was leading the seminar come up and give like kind of like a little overview of what it was going to be. And I was just really, I felt like the Holy Spirit come on me when this guy Don Davis spoke, and he's the um, director of like the sports mission outreach, and he's the NFL program because he actually played in the NFL. So I went to see what he had to say, and his seminar was entitled, uh, Don't Trade Temporary, No, Don't Trade Future Blessings for Temporary Treasures. And so he basically gave us a little bit of what his life is like. He's played in the NFL for 11 seasons. Well, he played in the NFL for 11 seasons. He was in four Super Bowls, and he actually won two Super Bowls. But I could see, like, the joy that he had in being, like, he's basically the chaplain for all of the NFL. And he said, like, the guys that he's building up, he called them his babies. So you could just see the joy he had, you know, working for the Lord and doing the Lord's work was way more than the joy he felt when he was playing in the Super Bowl. And he just spoke so much into my life. Like he, you know, he's living like a man's dream. That's, if you've ever played football, you want to play in the big game, you want to play in the big dance. And that just really spoke to me. And I think like the conference altogether was just really good. I don't think any of the men that went there left unimpacted. And uh, for all you ladies out there, they're actually having an Iron Sharpens Iron for Women October 12th in, um, I forget where it's at, but we should definitely get some grace women to go out there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. There will be a conference for women. It's the first time they've done that. It's in Moline. Um, so it's like a trip, you ladies. You get to go for a day, maybe a couple of days, but more will be said about that. As we continue to worship, we're going to receive the offering. And before the deacons come forward, uh, we've just sung a song about assurance. Many people live, even come to church, 
week after week and live without assurance. They don't have that hope, that surety in their life. But in the early 1900s, Fanny Crosby wrote that hymn. She died in 1915. I don't know exactly uh, what year she wrote the hymn. But she wrote that hymn talking about the assurance she had in the Lord. She lived to be 95. She wrote over 8,000 songs. And from the time that she was uh, very young, there was a, a, a medical problem, improper medical treatment. And so actually at six weeks old, she was blind. She couldn't see from that point on. But she had this peace and that assurance. And it's right out of the text that we've been looking at in 1 John 5, 13, the assurance that there is in Christ. And so we, we just sang a great hymn of the church. As the offering is being received, we're going to turn to a joyful song written about 1980, a song declaring that we're saved. And uh, this so song's a bit loud, but it's joyful. And uh, many times we kind of sit back, oh yeah, I'm saved. But I, I hope that you can share in the joy of the song as we receive the offering. <laughs> was blinded by the devil, born on red ruins, stone cold dead as I stepped out of the womb. His grace I have been touched, by his word I have been healed, by his hand I've been delivered, by his spirit I've been sealed, now I am saved. saved. By the blood of the Lamb, thank God I'm saved. By the blood of the Lamb. I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm so glad. Now I'm gonna thank you, Lord. I just wanna thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. By his strength I do adore, by his power I lift him, his love I am secure. He bought me with the prize and freed me from the dead, born of emptiness and wrath, and the fire that burns in it. And now I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. And now I'm so glad. So glad.
here saved by the blood of the Lamb? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Just want to take a moment to pray for Andy, shall we? Lord, I just thank you for this brother. Lord, I just thank you for the words that you put on his heart. And Lord, I just ask the Spirit to take over. Lord, help Andy to get out of the way and just be your messenger this morning. We look forward to what he's going to say. And Lord, I just pray for us as a congregation that we can hear the, the glorious message of the fact that we're saved because of what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We're in 1 John chapter 2 and picking up at verse 18 as we go through uh, this letter the Apostle John wrote. We're talking about persevering love of God, the love of God that encourages us to hold on as he holds on to us. We want to persevere in the faith. But, you know, it raises a lot of questions, and I think there are people who, who question the fact, am I saved? Am I all right with God? When the day comes, will I be in heaven? <laughs> or where will I be? And there's other questions, especially that are raised in this section of Scripture. There's a question about what happens to people who look like they're Christians and yet seem to fall away. Can you lose your salvation? I had a college friend that I was involved in some Bible studies with, and my friend was a source of encouragement. We even went to some training for a weekend um, in order to be leaders the next year in Bible studies. He worked at a Christian camp over summer, and they said he was like the best counselor uh, to those students. And um, over a few years of college, he kind of was up and down, it looked like, spiritually. And at one part, I was questioning where he was at, and we got separated. I was done with school, and then we both came back for a weekend, it was a homecoming time, and we were both back, and I was glad to see him and asked how things were going, and, and he wanted to set things right, right away. He wanted to put the boundaries right out there so I knew what was going on in his life. He said, well, I got in town a couple of days ago, and I was high a couple of times already, slept with my girlfriend, and uh, on and on he went, and he, I said, okay, I, I get the picture. You, you're, really, you're really not t walking with the Lord, are you? And it, what happened? How can somebody be connected and now disconnected? How can I be sure where I'm going to be? And yet, John has been writing about that, 1 John 5, 13, this verse that we've already referred to, these things I've written to you who believe, who believe, those who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And, and so today as we go through this passage, I want us to see that true Christians are saved by Jesus. They're, they're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And they're kept by the Father. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be concerned about our eternal se security if we're in Christ. So we pick up at verse 18, chapter 2. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But they're going showed that none of them belong to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. 
And you do not need anyone to teach you, but as the anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. As John writes here, he says, beware, beware, be aware of a couple of things. Be aware of what time it is and be aware of those who are speaking. And so he says, be aware, wake up. Uh, we've taken many uh, trips and uh, as we would get up early for those trips, I, I think sometimes my family would walk, sleepwalk to the car. They would get out there and they, they would certainly wouldn't be awake. And, and John is saying here, sometimes as believers, we, we walk around like we're sleeping. We're walking in our sleep. You know, when it comes to sports like football, there's that two-minute drill. Like, you know, the game's important, but when it gets down to two minutes, this is really important. This is crunch time, and everything depends on these two minutes. And John is saying, here we are. This is urgent. Wake up. This is the last hour. Are you surprised? I mean, he said that 2,000 years ago. How could it be the last hour? But the scripture teaches that. From the time of Jesus coming and his ascension, we entered the last days, the last hour. And at any point, he could return. At any point. And that's what John is saying. Be awake. This is the last hour. And some people don't get it. it you know, you may have seen the news a couple weeks ago where this meteor was going over uh, Russia. Did you see pictures of that where the meteor was going over Russia? A and some people said, this is it. This is the end of the world. It, it could have been. Uh, we know now it wasn't. It could have been the end of the world. And there are many natural catastrophes, and people begin to ask these questions. And the scripture says, this is the last hour, so be awake. Hebrews 1 puts it this way. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir over all things and through whom he made the universe. So the last days began with Jesus coming in his ascension. The son has come and the Holy Spirit has come out, has been poured out in a new measure. Acts 2 gives us indication. And the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. And so already, Calvin says, already in John's day, before the end of the first century, in the church age, in the age of the apostles, already there are these threats, it seems, to the church. There's this teaching that isn't true and is characterized by the Antichrist. And it's plural. Those who come and oppose Jesus. Those who who don't speak truth, but speak a lie. Isn't that interesting that John is writing about liars? Here is the apostle of love calling people deceitful, calling people liars because they're adversaries of Jesus. Paul said that that was going to happen. He was on his way to Jerusalem. He knew he'd be arrested for being a follower, a missionary, of the church. He knew the Jews would stop him, and as he was en route to Jerusalem, he stopped and he met with the elders of Ephesus. And in Acts 20, we read his words to these elders Keep watch over yourselves and over the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, in other words, Paul saying, after I'm gone, after I'm dead, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Where are they going to be? They're going to be on the inside of the church. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Wake up to what's going on. That's what he says. Jesus said that in Mark 13 as well, that False prophets will appear. They will perform signs and miracles. They will try to lead people astray. And John says, already people, it's happening. 
in the church already. And who are these people? Verse 22, they are liars. They are people who deny that Jesus is the Christ. Many times we think of Antichrist and that word and what that means. It only appears in John's writing in 1 and 2 John. Although Paul speaks of the man of lawlessness, the man doomed to destruction. Daniel speaks of the little horn. So there are other images, but only in John. And it's plural. It's any teacher who stands against Christ and who he is. So John writes, not to say worry, but he writes to assure us. And that's the second thing we want to see here. We can be assured that we are saved. You can be sure of this. You don't have to doubt. When the hard times come, when people start leaving the faith, you don't have to begin to question your own situation. On uh, Wednesday, we were at the Capitol, and uh, we were moving from one place um, to another building, and we're going underground. And so um, we started to get on the elevator, and only a few could get on, so the rest of the group waited. And so we got on the elevator. I was with the second group, and we got on, and we went down, and nothing happened. So then we went up, and then we went back, and then we went down again. Nothing happened. We got, <laughs> we got to where we wanted to go, and the door wouldn't open. And I think a lot of people have that fear. There's going to come that day, and will the door open for me to go into heaven, or won't it? I've been with people in sick beds who've asked that question after growing up, living life in church. I'm not quite sure. And John writes this letter so you can be sure, so I can be sure that when that day comes, the Lord is going to say, come on in, enter in. Well done, faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. And so we can be assured of our salvation. What we're talking about here is a theological term. It's called the perseverance of the saints or eternal security that if God saves us, he keeps us. He doesn't let go. He holds on to us. John 6, and this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. John says this, God has given me these people, and I won't lose any of them. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And even as he prays, even as he prays that night that he's arrested, he says, I've lost none except the son of perdition who wasn't chosen by God. I have lost none. They're all saved because God will not let go. And yet John says there are many fakes. There are many fakes out there. And there are many people who maybe don't understand what they should or shouldn't believe. We see that there are many spirits. John points that out in 4th chapter, verse 3. But every spirit that's not acknowledged Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. And so some people are very sincere about what they believe, but they don't believe the right thing. Warren Wiersbe talks about this, that people believe it makes no difference what you believe as long as you're sincere. Well, you could take some uh, medicine out of a, a bottle and think it's going to help you, but if the bottle really contains poison, <laughs> it'll kill you, not help you. You can be sincere that this is going to help me, but sincerity, sincerity isn't enough. There has to be truth. And the scripture says Jesus is truth. Jesus is the one who saves. You know, many people have felt deceived. It came out in the news this week about our representatives and how they stole from campaign funds. And people said, I felt deceived. I thought he was for us. I felt like he was part of us and he was fighting for us. But evidently, he wasn't. I felt deceived. And what John is saying here, there are people that 
are somehow in the church and yet go out with a different teaching. And in time, their true colors come out. Notice again what it says in verse 19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. They may have been part of the roles of the church, but they didn't belong because if they had, they would have stuck it out in the faith, but their going out shows their true colors. They didn't really come to a place of trust in Christ. And you say, how can that be? We see that in King Saul. He was king over Israel, and at times he made some good decisions, but in the end, we see where his heart was really at. We see that in Judas. He walked with the Lord for about three years, but in the end, he looked for a different Jesus. He, he looked for one who was going to overthrow Rome, not in a Savior who would die for him. Years ago, I met a uh, RCA pastor who's now with the Lord, a great man, and I heard him speak. And he gave a powerful testimony. And he talked at one point of how he was in ministry. He had gone through seminary and he was in ministry. And then he was converted. Then he was saved. In other words, he had been teaching for a while, preaching. And he wasn't even a Christian. It can happen. I know for myself, I joined the church before I was a Christian. That, that's not the right order. But I know that's what happened. I thought for a while I knew where I was with the Lord. I could answer a lot of questions, but my heart had never been surrendered. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with the inscription, The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So everyone who trusts in God we'll begin to live a more holy life. We've been talking about that earlier in this book. We trust and we're transformed. We want to live more like Jesus. We turn away from the past. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves. See whether you're in the faith. That's a good thing to do. Am I right with God? Have I truly surrendered? This is a time where it's not for anyone to judge someone else. It's a time for the spirit to convict, to either assure or to convict us so that we're right with him. Again, we're talking about eternal security and the fact that, you know, you can have a field and maybe you've gone by a soybean field and you've seen corn growing up, these stalks of corn. But the Bible says there's all these tares that will come up among the wheat. But at the harvest, you'll know what's Truly, the grain and what's a weed. In the Canons of Dort, written in 1618, 1619, this article comes in the last section. Because of these remnants of sin dwelling in them, and also because of the temptation of the world and Satan, those who have been converted could not remain standing in this grace. Uh, what it's saying here is because there's still sin in me, I, I couldn't stand alone. I couldn't make it. I couldn't persevere on my own if left to their own resources. But God is faithful, mercifully strengthening them in grace once conferred on them and powerfully, powerfully preserving them in the end. We, we just heard this song, saved, born, blinded, already ruined when I came into this world born that way, but a miracle of God, God breaks in, makes himself known, and a person comes to faith. And then the truth of the scripture is God keeps those he saves. We're kept. There's a, another doctrine that's pointed out here that there's the visible and the invisible church. The, the visible church is Everyone we could see who might be here, the invisible churches, the God sees the people who are truly converted, those who are truly right with him. And that's what John is saying. In time, in time we know, we may not know right now, but 